here with Crystal uh, back at the Field Museum. Crystal, what is it that you do here? I am the collection manager of insects at the Field Museum of Natural History. You, you're an entomologist. I am. You study insects. What, yeah. is, what is your area of focus? So um, I study water beetles. Specifically, I study a group called the riffle beetles. And the riffle beetles are the greatest beetles on earth. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't seem, you don't think that might be a bit of a bias statement? I don't. What's so great about riffle beetles? So, also, whenever I hear the word riffle beetles, I feel like there should be a guitar riff. Like a beer, <laughs> like beetles. <laughs> riffle beetles live underwater and they carry a bubble of air with them and they hold that air bubble for the rest of their life. Really? And that can be up to five years or so. You put me underwater with one bubble, I'll probably. Die. Part of it is that they're so tiny that they're actually able to use some of the natural properties of water in order to breathe. There's lots of different kinds of air in the air bubble. There's uh -huh. oxygen, there's carbon dioxide, there's nitrogen. And as they use the oxygen in the air bubble, the pressure of the oxygen goes down and it's less than is in the surrounding water. And so oxygen passively diffuses back into that air bubble. What? And so as they use oxygen and give off carbon dioxide in the air bubble, the concentration of the carbon dioxide in the air bubble increases compared mm -hmm. to the surrounding water. The carbon dioxide then diffuses back out into the water. What would be the evolutionary imperative for an organism to want to undergo so many adaptations that allows this to happen? Like what's so great about living in the water? Why, why did the beetles want this to This is why back? I work on water beetles. <laughs> it was just an empty niche. There was nothing there. There were no beetles living there. Yeah. And nothing eating the periphyton. And so these beetles, I guess, saw that as an opportunity and they went underwater. And what's actually cool is that there's closely related groups that will go into the water, but they really? won't stay underwater. Oh. So you can kind of almost see that gradient from life entirely out of water to a life entirely underwater where they never leave. Yeah, I, it reminds me of like whales, you know, coming you know, ancient relatives of whales uh, mm -hmm. came out of the ocean. And then at some point they were like, you know, wasn't so bad in there. And right. then like, then they exactly. evolved to like go back to the ocean. Exactly. And what's really cool is that you can see this happen over and over and over again in the riffle beetles. You were just on a collecting trip to New Zealand. I was. We collected all around the South Island, so we traveled from stream to stream, sampling each stream, looking for different populations yeah. of water beetles. Why is it so important to go to so many different streams? Like, what, why don't you just go to one New Zealand stream and, oh, well, that's good. Because every stream has a different population. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine a watershed, it's like a hand mm -hmm. with lots of little fingers that come out and each of those little fingers is a stream and they all come together into one larger stream and that's a watershed. Mm -hmm. You might have another watershed over here, maybe there's a mountain in the middle and those two are separate. Mm -hmm. And so they might have separate evolutionary paths. So what we can do is we can study all those populations, we can study their morphology so how they look, mm -hmm. we can use their DNA to try to figure out how they're related, how far into the past or how deep into the past mm -hmm. they separated. So you might be able to match that up with different geological events. You mentioned how important water beetles are for learning about the health of New Zealand streams, mm -hmm. but they also live all over the world. Actually, we know a lot more about the water beetles in the US than we do about the water beetles in New Zealand. In fact, we had a curator here named Harry Nelson who worked on the same group of water beetles that I do. And he geo-referenced every place he collected on a map. This is just an example of one of the maps that Harry Nelson had, um, had put together. And what's really cool about it is he actually outlined all of the watersheds in Illinois on this map in different colors. And now we can actually use Geographic Information System, or GIS. Um, we can use Google Earth. In fact, you can go on Google Earth right now and you can put all of your collecting localities on Google Earth right now. If oh! You really wanted to. Oh, the time I found a dead raccoon on the side of the road and brought it in. Put it on a map. Yeah. 
Streams are super important environments. And when I think of like, when you're trying to conserve an area, a lot of times streams are kind of neglected. You know, you can put a border around a national park or a protected area, but sure. the stream goes in and the stream comes out and exactly. there are opportunities for invasive species and pollution to like go into that, that stream. Are water beetles another one of those bioindicator species? They are, they oh. actually make a pretty good bioindicator because a lot of species of riffle beetles, at least we've seen in North America that mm -hmm. a lot of species of riffle beetles will be sensitive to things like paper mill pollution, rayon plant pollution, changes in pH. It's nice to conserve them mm -hmm. for their inherent value, like, oh, this is a species of water beetle that only lives in this stream or watershed. But really, we can use them as a tool to determine water quality. You were obviously super stoked about seeing all these water beetles yes. in New Zealand. Was there anything else that you saw that was also really exciting? Yeah, so one of my favorite insects that I saw in New Zealand, it's called a blepharcerid. What? Blepharceridae. Blepharcerid. There you go. Sounds like someone sneezed like blepharcerid. <laughs> these blepharcerids are a type of fly Mm -hmm. and they're unlike any fly you've ever seen before. Their larvae actually live in the coldest, cleanest, most riffly streams there are. So right where you find riffle beetles. Oh. What they do is they've got little suction cups on their body and they suction cup to rocks and streams. Mm -hmm. What's really fun is that when you're collecting in the stream, you're disturbing all the critters in the stream. Mm -hmm. And what happens is they get disturbed too, and then they float off, and then they stick to your legs. The little and suctions. You have little suction cups sticking to your legs. It's really cute. It sounds like an adorable maggot. It's an adorable maggot. Because that's what they are. The that's their new common name, the adorable maggots. The adorable maggots. I like that. If I, I had to work on a fly, I would work on blepharocerids. Yeah, I think I would too. I probably, there's probably a chance I'll do that, but I'll just look at pictures of them. Okay. Little videos. It still has brains on it.